Is reality about to catch up with fiction? Could it be that water contains an almost inexhaustible source of energy that is within everyone's reach? And what if hydrogen could redefine our future? Faced with climate change resorting largely from human activity, the quantities of CO2 released into the atmosphere by industries and transportation are widely blamed, particularly in the latest IPCC reports. In order to imagine a viable future by 2100, finding a sustainable alternative to our fossil fuels is now urgent. And in this quest for a future green gold, hydrogen is a serious contender. This energy source is not new, but it is now ready to be deployed after a long scientific and technical history, particularly in the field of transportation. But how can such a solution be implemented? What vehicle could be powered by this hydrogen tomorrow? And how can we make it a low carbon energy carrier? Because although hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe, producing it is not easy and the current process is highly polluting. Today, the problem with hydrogen is that it is very rarely found in its natural state. It's found to some extent in Russia and in Mali, where it's beginning to be used. There are no known natural deposits in France, so hydrogen must be produced. This is what we call an energy vector. We know different processes to make this hydrogen. The usual way to make grey hydrogen being from natural gas. It's a process that generates large amounts of CO2, since 9 kilos of carbon dioxide are produced for each kilo of hydrogen. Well, now, there are two solutions to make this grey hydrogen greener. Either we recover the CO2 emitted since we produce CO2 when we make hydrogen. Let's use the CO2, or at least remove it in such a way that it doesn't enter the atmosphere. That's the first thing, the capture and storage of CO2. And then the second thing is producing hydrogen in a different way. One way to do it is to use water as a source of hydrogen and to dissociate this H2O water molecule into two molecules, H2 on one side and O on the other, in simple terms, to make what is called an electrolysis. In order for this electrolysis to produce greener hydrogen, the electricity that powers the process must itself be decarbonized. It can come from renewable energies, but also from nuclear energy, which emits very little CO2. At the end of this production process, this green hydrogen in its gaseous state is ready to conquer new markets. And this operation is reversible. The energy in the hydrogen gas can be converted into electrical energy using a device called a fuel cell. The energy contained in hydrogen is therefore convertible and transportable. This could revolutionize tomorrow's transportation, a perspective that is nothing new. Assailli, pour ne pas dire agressé par les décibels, plongé dans une atmosphère qui atteint en certains points de certaines villes la limite de pollution admissible, l'homme de la civilisation du moteur est aujourd'hui sérieusement menacé dans son équilibre. Peut-il croire à un avenir meilleur Ce n'est pas impossible. Le moteur à explosion a atteint un tel stade de perfection qu'il est très difficile à déboulonner. Mais par contre, on peut imaginer, surtout dans les villes, des voitures électriques qui ne fonctionneraient pas avec des accumulateurs, mais avec des piles à combustible. The operating principle of the fuel cell was first demonstrated in 1838. For a long time, the fuel cell was disconnected from what could be considered today as the hydrogen industry. In the 19th century, we began to use hydrogen industrially. Urban lighting in France began with lighting gas, which contained 50% hydrogen. The 
fuel cell did not really work and could not be made a functional technical object. In the 1970s, the fuel cell once again became the solution to the energy crisis and then to the environmental crisis in general. And now, we feel that new social groups promote hydrogen and fuel cells for other purposes, which seem to be related to energy storage. This fuel cell, which transforms gaseous hydrogen into electricity, is at the heart of the work of the FEMTO-ST. In this laboratory, researchers subject these cells to chemical, thermal, or electrical phenomena. The aim is to measure their performance directly and try to increase their lifespan. This is a hydrogen fuel cell. It's something on which we will be able to connect all of our interfaces. We connect a hydrogen inlet to the fuel cell, then an oxygen inlet. This oxygen generally comes from the ambient air through an air compressor to push oxygen into the fuel cell. Then, as electricity and heat are produced, the electricity is channeled through a system that recovers the electric current produced by the fuel cell. The heat is recovered through a cooling circuit, so a third circuit allows the extraction of the calories produced. Obviously, the purpose is to be able to heat a home, the interior of a vehicle, or to provide domestic hot water. Inside, we assemble what we call bipolar plates. And in the middle, a polymer membrane paired with electrodes on which we place the platinum catalyst that allows the reaction to take place. Once I have assembled all these elements, I obtain what we call the stack, a fuel cell associated with a system capable of supplying electricity and heat. So, from the moment we produce electricity and heat, there are many possible uses for a fuel cell. Obviously, we immediately think of applications in transportation, because with electricity we can run electric motors and therefore ultimately power any kind of vehicle. In 20 years, we have increased performance in terms of density, power, volume of the object by around 50%. We have increased the lifespan by 50%, and there are different advantages. The first one, obviously, from a macro point of view, is to be able to charge an electric vehicle in a few minutes, like a conventional thermal vehicle, to have a very high level of autonomy. And there are benefits that are completely different from a battery electric vehicle. So these two technologies should not be seen as competing, but as complementary. Typically, a battery electric vehicle is perfectly suited to short trips in the city center with light vehicles. On the other hand, for longer journeys or with heavier vehicles, which ultimately require much faster recharging and greater autonomy, the hydrogen electric vehicle makes sense. The most ecological transportation around will be the electric train. Nothing will be more efficient. And what better use of electricity than bringing it directly over the train on a catenary, taking it directly to the motors and powering them with it. Now, when it comes to regional transport, or when there are three, four, six trains a day to serve sparsely populated areas, will you be willing to invest in extremely high electrification costs in relation to the traffic? The answer so far was no. Until now, the only solution to keep these lines alive in certain areas was to use diesel trains that do not need a catenary. Except that today, we've said stop. We've stopped using diesel trains. We have to find something else. This something else entered the German railroads in 2018, and it's called Island. It is the first hydrogen train in the world. The fuel cells on its roof are powered by hydrogen gas and oxygen from the air. This train, which can reach a speed of 140 kilometers per hour, has a range of about 1,000 kilometers between refuels, which makes it possible to provide a regional link. Twelve of these trains should be in service in France by 2025.
When you have a hydrogen train that arrives in a station, it's electric, it makes no noise, it emits water vapor, so it doesn't smell, it's clean, and when you're inside, there's no vibration. It's a very quiet train with no vibrations. So there you go, from a passenger experience point of view, it's an electric train that makes its own electricity from stored hydrogen and oxygen from the air. It's not about opposing different technologies, but with battery-based technology, when the battery can no longer last for a full cycle, which is what it needs to do, then you have to replace a lot of material. The big advantage of hydrogen is that a hydrogen fuel cell can be repaired. What wears out is the membrane. Of course, it will take time to dismantle, change the membranes to reassemble, and so on. But from an environmental point of view, it's a very efficient product. To popularize these new modes of hydrogen transportation, the industry needs science, particularly in the field of raw materials. Electrolyzers and fuel cells designed around ceramic cells will have to incorporate materials that are more recyclable and require smaller quantities of precious metals. One of the objectives of our research here is to effectively manufacture new raw materials. So we're really trying to obtain all the characteristics of the original materials, their composition for which we use advanced X-ray techniques and electron microscopy, among other methods, and then to achieve the same level of performance. After this, we process the material and compare it to the original. We have also begun recycling to see how these materials can can be reused, given that for 100 kilowatts of electrolysis, we have about 40 kilos of nickel. So it's important to be able to collect it. And we also have other ceramic materials that can be recovered. The idea here is to determine whether a cell can be reused at the end of its life. Cutting into these components to make new cells and then retesting these new cells to see if they perform identically when compared with the mother cell. It's easy to imagine the hydrogen landscape in about 10 years. The progression of hydrogen has been lightning fast, but not necessarily in the private sector, more in the industrial sphere, where the electrolyzer will be implemented for manufacturing and producing hydrogen in large quantities. This hydrogen will be green hydrogen, using either green or decarbonized electricity. It is the industrial sector that will recover this hydrogen to replace the gray hydrogen that is currently used. And then there will be a supply of hydrogen which can be used for transportation. Not everyday transportation for the moment, but definitely heavy transportation. In 2020, 80% of the world's goods were transported by sea a sector that accounts for 2.5% of global CO2 emissions. This field is also seeking to begin its energy transition. The thousands of container ships that travel the oceans are powered by one of the dirtiest fuels in the world, emitting significant amounts of CO2, but also nitrogen oxides and sulfur. The laboratory ship Energy Observer has been sailing the seas for five years. It is able to produce hydrogen on board from the electrolysis of seawater. When its solar panels and wind turbines are no longer sufficient to supply the ship's electric battery, hydrogen takes over. With hydrogen compared to batteries, we have eight times more energy for the same weight. The heavier the transportation becomes, the more apparent this energy vector is. It is complex to produce hydrogen on board in destabilizers, in electrolysis, etc. But in the end, what interested me was to have an educational tool used to serve and educate the public, government and industries, and to show a kind of virtuous circle of energy that can be duplicated on a medium or even very large scale. We are not going to stop here because we are now familiar with hydrogen gas. In the beginning, people told me it wasn't possible, that it was difficult, that it wasn't sufficiently developed. 
That's not true. It works perfectly well. Now, the objective is to have more impact, especially in the maritime industry. The Energy Observer 2, a cargo ship that can carry 70 tons of liquid hydrogen on board, might be a good illustration of the maritime transport of tomorrow. This hydrogen requires a volume of storage four times larger than maritime diesel. The storage issue is a key problem in the hydrogen sector. We need to find storage methods that are efficient and safe, and that provide lots of autonomy for transportation. Storing hydrogen as efficiently as possible is the research focus of many French laboratories, whose scientists study the possibilities offered by the different states of matter, whether gaseous, liquid, or solid. It is in this form that Fermin Cuevas and his team are trying to trap this hydrogen using new materials. Hydrogen is a very light gas. So if we want to store it, it takes up a lot of space in a defined volume. For example, if you look at this small bottle, one liter of volume, a bottle of water, if we put hydrogen inside, only a little less than 0.1 gram of hydrogen will fit in, or 100 milligrams of hydrogen at room temperature pressure. It's a very low-density gas. To store a large amount of hydrogen in this finite volume, we will therefore have to compact it. We have several options to do that. The first option would be to compress the hydrogen at very high pressure and then introduce 40 grams of it in one liter of this bottle. A second option is to cool it down to a very low temperature. By cooling it to below minus 253 degrees Celsius, the hydrogen becomes liquid. And at this point, we can store even more, about 70 grams of it per liter. And finally, we have a third option, since some materials are solid and have the ability to absorb hydrogen. In this way, we can reach volumetric capacities, densities of about 150 grams of hydrogen per liter. Some of these solid materials are able to react spontaneously with hydrogen at room temperature at a few bars of pressure. The hydrogen molecule comes into contact with the surface of these metals, dissociates on the surface, and the hydrogen atoms, which are very small, are able to penetrate and move inside this solid material. This is the enclosure in which we have our material that will react with hydrogen. When the hydrogen comes in contact with this material, it moves inside the material. This absorption of hydrogen makes the material swell and the mechanical tensions transform it into powder. This is a solid storage solution in which you can store a lot of hydrogen in a very small volume, like what we have here. If the hydrogen is heated slightly, it can be desorbed from the material. The reaction is reversible. Today, the most common system for mobility, and heavy mobility in particular, is the storage of compressed hydrogen. Today, it is the preferred solution for heavy transportation, because it's easy to implement. The solid storage solution will make the tank more compact, though it adds more weight to the system. More research must be done in the future to lighten this type of material. At the CNRS, there are many laboratories that have been working on these types of problems for a long time. And today, they have high hopes of developing our research further and moving forward, improving the properties of our materials thanks to the funding which we have just received. This funding will allow us to continue our work for quite a long time. We have projects that can last more than five years 
and we can have a certain peace of mind in finding new materials for hydrogen storage. Before hydrogen distribution networks are deployed on a massive scale throughout the country, scientists must set up safety standards. There is also the question of hydrogen's reputation to be explosive. Demystifying the fear of hydrogen explosion. This is one of the missions of Nabia Shomex. She leads the shockwave team which has developed numerous experimental installations dedicated to the dynamics of flames. Hydrogen is a very light gas made up of two hydrogen atoms and which burns. And since it's so light, the way it burns is going to be a little different from other fuels. Another great characteristic is that it has no carbon. So again, this changes the way it burns and how it's perceived or used. This is a very important feature. We've been studying hydrogen for many years, if only because it was used a lot in space propulsion and certain industries. Now it's a matter of bringing it to society and somehow demystifying the assumption that it is a gas everyone should be wary of. I think that for any technology, you have to know how it behaves. You have to put everything in place to use it safely and not be more afraid of it than natural gas or LPG or propane. Hydrogen loves obstacles. It can be ignited with a very small amount of energy. It moves at two or three meters per second, and as soon as it encounters these obstacles, it accelerates and transforms into a flame that will cover 2,000 to 3,000 meters per second. And this is where the pressure effect becomes significant and destructive. So the goal is to try to understand the conditions under which this hydrogen changes form. The hydrogen flame changes and strongly accelerates. How can this change be avoided? And if this acceleration starts to occur, what can be done to mitigate it? In order to reduce and mitigate the effects of an explosion and before distributing hydrogen in our society and supplying it to consumers, the conditions and type of transition between slow and fast combustion have to be defined. The French strategy is based on the production of approximately 600 to 700 kilotons of decarbonized hydrogen by 2030. This quantity of decarbonated hydrogen should make it possible to eliminate about 6 million tons of CO2 emissions, which is about three times those of 350,000 private cars per year. So that's quite significant. For the whole industrial sector, but also for research laboratories, the existence of this plan at the government level means that France has chosen to move forward with determination. Therefore, from that point on, convincing industrialists is no longer a question of persuading them that we have to move towards cleaner, more environmentally friendly and more efficient solutions. So now it's simply a matter of matching these investments, which must be made privately, but also publicly with regard to our investment capabilities and also those of the industrial sectors to change, because obviously this takes time. Industry players were strongly motivated and were on the same wavelength as the government, spurred on by industry and highly structured research. Two major research centers, the CNRS and the CEA, worked hand-in-hand -hand to sketch the outline of the main research areas necessary for France to maintain its leadership in hydrogen at the international level. Storing hydrogen in a safe and reversible way, improving the efficiency and lifespan of fuel cells, making a standardized distribution network possible, and developing more efficient materials. These are all avenues for research in the years to come, for it is perhaps in these laboratories that the world of tomorrow is being prepared.
that of a hydrogen made green by using electricity from renewable energies or with low CO2 emissions and transportation that is finally free of fossil fuels. The question is no longer whether hydrogen mobility will develop, but rather at what pace.